Hello YouTube, my name is Zach, and today I have a very special guest with us. This is Mr. Jim Gray from the prog metal, Australian prog metal band, Caligula's Horse. He is uh, one of my absolute favorite prog rock singers. I love the band. They're, I think that they are the best prog metal band out right now, so uh, I think you guys are really going to enjoy hearing his insight. He's a really cool guy. So take it away, Jim. You want to introduce yourself and say a little about yourself? Hello. Uh, what Zach said. Um, <laughs> Um, my name's Jim. I, I'm not an alcoholic. Uh, I'm just trying to make better choices <laughs> in my life. Um, I've been singing since I was like nine years old. Um, I've done a whole a range of different styles. I've studied classical voice and jazz voice, and I've been writing uh, original uh, music since I was about yeah, 16, 17 years old with mixed results. Uh, and I'm now 31, so I've been doing it for a while. Um, but yeah, happy to, happy to be here and have a chat. Awesome. Very cool. Yeah. So what we're going to do today is uh, we're just going to kind of talk a little bit about what it's like to, for him to be on tour, kind of what he does in the band, just his role as a singer and, and kind of contrast it with some of the ways that I approach things as, as a voice teacher. And, you know, as, as we, we were just actually discussing this, that there's a difference between me sitting in my studio and saying like, oh, this is how you should and shouldn't do things when you're singing. And, you know, then there's a, then you have to go out on tour and actually perform. So this is going to be kind of interesting, I think, for you guys to be able to hear that contrasting insight and maybe we can come to like a middle ground and like find a balance between the two so you said that you've done you did classical voice study and jazz voice study both mm -hmm. yeah I um I actually started uh when I was when I was nine years old I um, managed to score a, a scholarship to uh, quite a prestigious school here in, in Brisbane my hometown um through singing in a cathedral choir very cool. Um, which is which is fa it's a fascinating start. I mean, I have no religion, but it was a, it's a beautiful thing to be able to sing in an environment like that, uh, where the cathedral is itself an instrument, and like that's oh, yeah. really where my my ear started to get trained, and, and obviously the groundwork for all of my um, you know breath support and technique and stuff like that that became the ground floor for everything else. Um, after school finished, I studied uh, classical voice first at the Conservatory of Music here in Brisbane. And um, didn't like it. I uh, just didn't didn't like the environment. I mean, like to be clear, I was a seventeen year old idiot uh, who thought very highly of himself. Um, <laughs> and I just didn't I just didn't like the way that people were treating each other or me because I was so special. Um, so I, I went and auditioned for jazz and then um, studied that for a few years. Uh, and all of that has sort of crossovers into when I started writing original music with. Um, first arcane and then with Caligula's horse many years down the track yeah i can definitely relate to some of that especially like i i loved the process of developing my voice through the classical the bel canto technique but there there was this some of the most ridiculous pedantic clashes of ideologies within our music department <laughs> like this i mean just silly things like um one of my one of my one of the voice teachers at our faculty was like, "Don't use falsetto because you're never going to make any money doing it." And like you know, like just this ridiculous stuff. Exactly. Two yeah. thumbs so, up. Brilliant. Yeah, yeah. So, but this is the same person who always had all their all of their students go to competitions and go to Nats and you know always mm -hmm. perform great. But this person was also extremely driven in like the opera realm and wouldn't would not accept right. people going outside of that. And I mean, that's, that's how I was trained too, is to sing operatically. Mm -hmm. But my voice teacher was much more open-minded with regards to the ways that you can use the voice. And so I, I'm very, I'm very, uh, very lucky and very fortunate for that to have been the case, but I well, totally I mean, understand. And anecdotally, like uh, I use my falsetto all the time and I don't make any money. So it's kind of, I mean, they might've been right <laughs> from the beginning. Like I can't rule it out at this stage. Yeah, I I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I I guess it's Give it uh, time. Yeah. Well, I I think that as a singer, you need to be able to have a diverse sort of sound palette. Like, and and I actually struggle with that myself because I spent so much time learning the operatic, like the classical stuff. That when I move into settings that aren't necessarily classical, or you know, they're they're more like pop or even like rock anything that's not inside that like what they called art music whatever that means realm <laughs> yeah uh, like okay. i have trouble because i'm so stuck in that technique that it you know I, uh, it, getting out of it is hard but i think it's really important to be able to have a like a diverse musical palette in that sense yeah because it's not just developing the the musculature in itself but of course the coordination across the musculature and the you know register shift and all of that sort of thing you know that there's so much stuff that I mean, like I would not be able to, for example, go and sing uh, a classical music, piece of music now to like to save myself. Um, 
partly because my sight reading is is dead now. Um, but um, but I'm a rock and roller. What are you going to do? Um, <laughs> but yeah, so the, it, it's that it's all the different transitions and placements and stuff like that. And so I think that's where a lot of the um, that myth of you know singing one way harms the voice. Like a lot of classical teachers will say, like don't belt or whatever because it's going to harm your voice. It's not that it's doing damage. It's just that you're you know not honing this one thing that they want you to do you're trying to kind of spread across a couple of things and i caught that a lot uh and i was not interested in that conversation at the time yeah and that's that is a a big thing that i think keeps people from studying bel canto or classical technique and the way that i approach in my voice lessons when i teach people is like i'm going to teach you the way that i know is healthy and that I know is like backed by peer review, backed by academia to be healthy for you and not damage you. Mm -hmm. Now, once mm -hmm. you know these things, now you can make conscious choices and make educated decisions about the things that you do and don't do. And if you want to take voice lessons from me and then go scream, I mean, yeah, there, this, you know, there are issues with that. Science says you're probably going to hurt yourself over time, but at least you're aware of the implications and at least you can measure it out and be rational about it and not just go willy nilly and do whatever and cause all sorts of problems down the line. So that's, mm. that's my whole approach to it really when it comes to teaching. Right. I mean, like since you brought it up, we might as well talk about it. Uh, okay. the, uh, with the, the screaming thing, right? I mean, screaming or, or, you know, what they call vocal effects and things like that. I, I'm sort of a different point of view purely because I mean, sort of argues that, damage is being done over time i believe there's a certain point where uh style dictates what it is that you're doing and if you're um a purely you know death metal singer or black metal singer or, or something like that like vocal effects are the primary thing that you do then that's not damage that it's doing to your voice that's you know that's your technique that you're using all the time so to say that it's kind of uh that these effects are harmful to the voice i think kind of implies that there is a correct or an incorrect way to be making sound with the voice, you know what I mean? So it's like, I, I do understand the bio, biological side of what you're saying, but um, I'm gonna sort of paraphrase a, uh, an old teacher of mine um, from way back, she's awesome, uh, Dr. Irene Bartlett, who is an uh, uh, incredible teacher as well as um, academic in singing and vocal uh, teaching. Um, and she was basically pointing out, to put simply, uh, technique is good, habit is bad. So it's like nothing is, is is bad for you unless you're it's out of your control. You know, if if it's something in your tool belt that you're applying with a technique that you know exactly how to switch on or switch off, then it's perfectly fine. If it's a habit, something that you're doing just because you know every time you go to sing, you go, Wah! you know, like that's that's bad, right? So if you gotcha. can't switch it off, it's bad. Yeah, and that's, so that's, that's, that's that makes a lot of sense. I I think that the um the way that I've always learned it is you want to correlate your singing voice as closely to your speaking voice as possible. And that the most healthy sounds you're going to create are the sounds that are the most closely related to your speaking voice because you use your voice to speak 99.99999% of the time. And you sing so little that if you are, if you make, like you said, singing habits out of things that are completely unnatural, you're going to over time use the voice too much in ways that it wasn't really designed or whatever evolved or whatever you want to call it into being used. I'm I and I like I said, like I'm a big like one of the big things I, I hit a lot of my students with is like glottal onsets, you know, starting your 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 words with vowels, like with this really pop like uh, uh, that kind of thing. Like it's you know that that glottal stroke with the folds. I've been like it's been drilled in my head, avoid those at all costs because over time that you know that that little stroke that happens over and over again will eventually cause nodules. So I hit my students a lot for that, but there are some songs, and even in opera, like in, in some of these German like uh, art songs, you to pronounce some of the vowels, it's appropriate to have a little bit of glottal at the beginning of it. So it's for me, it's more of a, um, just a, a caution. And I, the, the biggest issue that I warn people about, especially with the harsh vocals, is that there are these people that are out there right now saying, oh, I have all this proof that this actually is healthy and it's sustainable. But when you look at the science and when you look at what they're trying to advocate, it doesn't hold up to scrutiny. So like, like it does, maybe this is the academic in me talking, but, but it's, I learned peer review, you know, like thought, like journal, you know, the academic process, the study case study, the way that you study things is kind of refined over time by the, um, you know, the development of different minds on the subject kind of coming together through this entire scientific method and process. 
and nothing that people have done with regards to like heavy metal vocals or screaming vocals none of it's gotten grants and that's a problem in and of itself that people aren't willing to fund the studies of this kind of stuff but then people have tried to do their own studies that have been really quickly like shot down by academia and my whole my whole philosophy behind it is that as soon as someone comes up with like a peer review study that says like this is a way that you can do this harsh stuff that is sustainable over time won't cause nodules you know won't um won't damage your folds, all that kind of stuff. I'm totally on board with it. Like I'm not opposed to the idea. I just, as an, as an educator, I feel like it would be academically irresponsible of me to teach something that I can't back up with conclusive science. Does that make sense? Well, I mean, you don't necessarily have to say that it's perfectly free of harm because neither is, is a great deal of rock singing. It, you know what I mean? Exactly. Like, no, so, I agree. But the, I think the fundamental point that I'm trying to get across is that people aren't going out into the world as singers to be, um, and I, actually, I don't even want to say it to be, you know, perfect technical singers, because right. to even say that it's perfectly technical comes with that classist attitude of like, this is the correct way to sing and anything outside of perfect safety is not. Um, so if you go into the world and you want to be an artist, you want to have, you want to communicate something, you have an idea or a message or something inside you want to express, uh, having different tools in your tool belt, whether they be perfectly safe or not, are the tools that you utilize to uh, transmit and communicate that message. So. To be honest, I would advocate more for, and again, like this, this might sound crazy, but like I would advocate more for a harmful sound that gets across the message that you want to get across than a perfectly safe sound that is totally inoffensive and totally harmless to you that doesn't get your message across. Because I think for me, the art is the core of the thing. The message is the core of the thing. And I agree about that the art is the most important element. Let me ask you this question to see what you think about this. Let's say that you were a voice teacher and you were teaching people like I do every day and that's your job. Mm -hmm. And all of a sudden this, you just start like a article comes out about you or some online review comes out about you where someone says, oh, well, the things that Jim Gray taught me destroyed my voice and the doctor said so. Yeah. So <laughs> then, then what do you do? Like, how do you, how would you approach that as an, as an educator? Well, um, I have I have actually taught before. I had a, a handful of um, eager beavers, uh, young students who were sort of entering the world of original music. And um, the way that I put it to them is that my my technical knowledge uh, was not as high as some other teachers would be. I mean, again, I've studied at a tertiary level, but I haven't gone on to study specific like pedagogy specifically. Um, so I understand a fair bit of the biology, but not to the extent that uh, that other teachers might. But um, what I can provide. Uh, is not only based on my hands-on experience of actually, you know, touring and writing music, but the focus for me is artistry and helping people to not just physically, but kind of um, fi figuratively find their own voice as well, uh, their own artistic voice uh, with which to speak. Uh, and so if that ended up with somebody uh, whose voice ended up a bit rattly and, and a bit sort of, as long as they were being honest, I, I wouldn't care. If, like, that's that's the thing. As long as their art was uh, communicating what they wanted to, um, then I would be proud of that. I mean, there's uh, not a universe without Tom Waits or Bob Dylan in it. And like, I know for a fact that those dudes aren't singing like uh, perfectly safely, you know what I mean? Yeah, um, I, that it's, it's very, so I have this thing, like I use Adele as like a really good example of like what you don't do with your voice. Like she breaks all the rules, but on the flip side, mm -hmm. she's worth a hundred million bucks. So, you know, you know, like she traded her voice for a hundred million dollars. Some people mm -hmm. are totally fine with it. She created the music she wanted to create and you know, mm -hmm. that's it. So, and I get that. So I don't, it's not that I disrespect people who don't, who don't, you know, follow all the perfect rules of pedagogy. It's just, I just want to make sure in my mind that people are consciously aware of things that they, it's just like anything. It's like the whole, don't lift with your left, lift with your legs. Don't lift with your back thing. You know, like mm -hmm. it's, it's just like that. It's, as long as I feel like I'm communicating that, that the things that I know are healthy, you can take that and mm -hmm. run with it however mm -hmm. you want. So, but it's good to hear your perspective too, because I don't hear this side of things very much because in, in a teaching perspective, your students mostly just say, okay, well, he's the teacher. I'm going to listen to him and do what he says. And then, and then in school, like, if you mentioned, like, I think there was one guy that I went to college with that came and talking about wanting to be a heavy metal singer. And he basically just got like ignored off the campus. 
like in the voice mm-hmm. department, like people just didn't pay him any mind. So, you know, it, it was a, uh, it's, it's, it's neat to hear the perspective of someone who's actually doing that kind of thing. And, and I guess the biggest thing I take away from it is that I agree that the artistry is first and, you know, that's the number one most important thing is to create something that's expressive and meaningful and impactful to people. And you do have your Bob Dylan's and your weights and those guys that are just, you know, breaking all the rules. And there, I don't, I don't think that there's anything inherently wrong with it in and of itself. So I agree with you in that sense. Mm. I, um, if you want to have a chat with somebody whose technical understanding of all of these uh, vocal effects is a little bit um, broader than mine, um, see if you can get in contact with a dude named Mitch Brackman, uh, who is the front man for an Adelaide um, progressive metal band called Dissidia. Um, D Y S I D I A. What's his name? Mark, um, what? Mark Brackman? Uh, Mitch Brackman. Mitch, Mitch Brackman. Mm-hmm. Um, because his, his work is really diverse and he can basically do everything. He's a guy that, you know, like he's supported us on tour around Australia and every time he's a really hard act to follow vocally because he'll just switch from the sweetest, most pure falsetto to the like guttural growls to high screams. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's, he's a phenomenon. Um, and he also teaches singing in that way as well. So he's got all of those. Um, he would be one of the people who reported that reportedly, you know, it's safe to sing this way and all of that. So he'd be, he'd have a really good discussion with you about that. If you get in touch yeah. with him, I would love to, cause see, like when I look online, like, I don't know if you've, you've heard the name Melissa Cross, I'm sure. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Do you know how much she charges for one hour? No, no. $300, no. 300 American dollars. Yeah. See, and, and when I see someone saying, I can teach you to sing healthily with screaming for $300 an hour, that makes me think like, I don't know. Alarm bells go off. Like some that doesn't sound right to me. So, well, I mean, if it's if it's if her sort of target audience is, um, you know, the top tier bands, touring bands, and what they're getting from her is not necessarily uh, new technique, but a way to more safely produce a sound on tour when they're doing thirty shows in a month. Then, like ah, three hundred bucks, I'd pay it. If, yeah. it, if it works, though, we, I mean, mm-hmm. she doesn't really have any science backing up what she says, and that's my biggest issue. Like, I, right? I want if I'm just but as you say, the science itself is biased towards a classist attitude. That, um, that's true. So it's like, I mean, demonstrably, her work does is successful and kind of, um, uh, I suppose, it can only be anecdotally proven at this stage, given yeah. that uh, the entire world or, or a great deal of the world of sort of. Um, what pedagogical academia with yeah. voices is surrounding classical style, which is a box that people like to put around things. I, I um, think I think I agree, and I think we desperately need some peer review, some case studies on other singing styles than just the classical. And even there's a little bit into the pop style, but like almost none mm-hmm. outside of the classical realm. So I I think that that kind of study would do the entire vocal academic realm a lot of good. It would help me out a lot because I keep up with that stuff. And I would love, oh, yeah. I would love to see a journal article come out, like really looking at that kind of material. I'd love to see it. So anyway, that's yeah, a, more tools in the belt. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So good, good stuff. Next question. Who would you say that your biggest vocal influences are? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot. Um, there, like historically, the ones that I sort of uh, grew up with and sort of came of age with. Um, I'm really heavily influenced by Tori Amos. I like. I know that it's probably a strange one to say, but like, if you dig into the back catalog now with that understanding, there's a lot of, um, particularly with the higher more falsetto and softer deliveries, there's a lot of Tori in there. And um, even if I'm not uh, sort of recreating any of her sounds uh vocally it's she's definitely kind of like uh spiritually there i guess in terms of the the emotive um honesty that she displays as like a real inspiration makes a um, lot of sense when i think about your singing style actually i can mm. now that i'm like i'm putting the pieces together that makes a lot of sense yeah cool um jeff buckley is a big one as well which is probably more obvious yeah. uh sort of songs like dragonfly i definitely let the uh the Buckley flag fly there. Um, and of course, like I don't think there's any alternative um, or metal singers around my age group who haven't in some way been influenced by Maynard James Keenan from Tool, but I, I, uh, I, I haven't listened to Tool or A Perfect Circle in, in years and years and years, but I had a really big phase of that in my late teens, early 20s, so that was another fundamental one for me. I think Maynard was um, a big Tori Amos fan too. Actually, I think I read. Yeah, I mean, they. I think they. They where they were friends, or at least they worked together once or twice, which is kind of cool. Yeah. Um, you can catch a duet of theirs if you go to YouTube and look up. They performed "Muhammad, My Friend" together at one stage. It's a gorgeous little duet. <clears throat> so how? Right, so, um, oh, go ahead. Sorry. 
Uh, well, I was just going to say that there's uh, I pride myself on not putting a full stop on my influences. Um, you know, it's like I've, I've had influences in the past, but right now I'm really influenced by a couple of sort of my contemporaries in the scene in that like I love listening to Einar from Leprous oh, and Arnor him. from um, uh, Agent Fresco as well. Oh, yeah, and I love him especially too. with Agent Fresco, oh man, incredible, right? Um, but Agent Fresco really opened up my confidence to be able to utilize my sort of higher falsetto more of the time with Caligula's Horse because like I had a bit of a, one of those for a long time uh and yeah listening to that stuff is, is a inspiration so yeah. yeah i i really love both of those bands lepers and agent fresco and I, I i love hearing the contrast with that like that head voice that really heady falsetto sound with the with the rock music it just there's something elegant about it and i, I love it and i love hearing singers that can easily navigate in and out of that those the, through the passaggio oh, yeah. and you know through mm -hmm. those ranges really well and you do that really well too so i mean that's that that's Thank one of the you. that's one of the things that i the one of the things that draws me to caligula's horse the most is your singing and i, I love so i love oh, your cool. approach to it so even though i might be like classically trained it doesn't mean that i can't like totally immerse myself and enjoy like yeah. stuff out you know outside of that realm so um so when you, so you go on tour with caligula's horse somewhat frequently so how do you uh how do you manage yourself uh, with how do you manage your voice while you're on tour what are some of the things you do um yeah, um, the in Australia it's kind of we 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 never really had to consider it so much um, because if you're a band like us, you're going to be touring metropolitan cities, and there's about six of them that you would travel to on tour. And because the culture here is different, um, you wouldn't just be doing it like Monday through Saturday or whatever. You'd do them over a couple of weekends. So the you know you do a run of maybe three shows in a row tops um, most of the time. Um, so there's not, nothing I really had to worry about until we sort of set our sights on Europe and started doing. Um, what grown-up bands do, uh, and touring, uh, and doing something like, I think this next tour is like 28 shows in a month or something like that. It's, it's like crazy. So once you start doing that, you start having to be more aware of, um, you know, what's risky and what's, uh, what you can do to kind of mitigate those, um, those, uh, factors. So like my, my three focuses, I suppose would be, uh, like hydration, deconstriction, and relaxation. I, th those would be my primary ones. Because like, obviously beforehand, there's all the legwork that goes into being vocally fit to go on tour. But just right. in terms of surviving, um, hydration is an easy one to miss. Like it really oh, is. It, it sounds so obvious. Like when, but you're on a tour bus and you're doing tourist stuff because you're a nerd. Uh, and like the day goes by and all of a sudden you realize you haven't hydrated and it's not. Like, I mean, you know this, but I don't know if viewers might know this, but like that, if you're just drinking water in that last half hour before the show or on stage, no it's good. not hydrating, nope. it's doing you no good. Um, so you have to be set up throughout the day for that. And even if it's like as simple as having a measured amount, like I have this bottle and I'm going to drink it three times throughout the day and making sure that you do that and that'll get you hydrated for the show. The other one is uh, steaming because obviously that's a really good way to directly hydrate the folds. Mm -hmm. Um, but I don't steam before a show. It's always morning and night. So like I wake up and I try to pour the dankest coffee I can find into every crevice in my <laughs> body. And at the same time, uh, you know, just have a gentle steam. Oh, and of course for, for viewers, that's like, that's not boiling water and then straight on the face. It's boiling water and then let it cool a little bit. And then yeah. you don't, yeah. you'll, otherwise you you'll hurt yourself. Damage yeah. yourself. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah. yeah, morning and night and hydration. That's the, that's the big one. Um, I think deconstriction wise, it's, it's, again, I try not to use my like full voice throughout the day. You know what I mean? It, like if I'm doing warm ups and stuff like that, I save that for right towards the end. The rest is just, yep. it's trying to keep these gentle sighs and things doing exercises like puffy cheek with your until, and yeah, 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 things like that. Really riding that soft dip thong through yeah, 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 yeah. Yes. And everything yep. ending in a sigh until my larynx feels like it's got butter around it. It's that really kind of giggly, soft kind of sound. And then I know that I've kind of defeated at least elements of that constriction. And the rest is just relaxation. I do a little bit of self-massage um, and uh, try not to yell too much and try not to talk over loud music after the show too much because that is a really tricky one. Because um, we pride ourselves in going out and meeting people. Like our fans are there for us and we want to be there for them. So we come out and we usually meet people at the merch desk but if it's at that stage at night where there's still loud music blaring all the time, you can't be like, yeah, hi, how's it going? You know, so you want to try and I, I try and kind of mime speak to people so like they tell you they love your stuff and you're like, 
<laughs> um, yeah. Which is uh, which might seem crazy, but it seems to be effective. So there's 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 tons of things, but those are just like a handful. I always learned what you drink the day before has a much bigger impact on the day you sing than what you when mm. what you drink on that day. So I completely agree with that. Like that constant, like just if you just sip water throughout totally. the day, kind of thing is so much better. And it's funny because the the vocalizations that you were just demonstrating, like a lot of the glissando type stuff, the you know that that kind of thing is well within the Italian like bel canto approach of of vocalization, like warm ups and things. So that that already like crosses directly over. I mean that's sim that's similar to the types of warm ups. Like all of my exercises are like yo 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 or ya 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 something like that. I mean, it's all very similar. So I, I don't necessarily think that the way you do things is too far off from the, the right way. No, so. not at all. I, I think it as well, like the, the, even through my general kind of pre-show warm-ups are probably going to have a lot in common right up until I get up until like belt prep, you know, and yeah. start trying to, you know, right towards the end, starting to do a little bit of repertoire stuff and really kind of belting it out and testing those, those areas of my voice. Um, and I kind of try to, you know, ask my voice to do things rather than tell it to do things you know it's like if i'm which is i know it seems like a strange thing to say but it's kind of like if you know if i'm on stage i'm trying to force something out um it's a not going to work and b not going to work the next three nights because when you've got runs of like 11 shows in a row or more and you know like music theater singles will tell you the same thing um because they those guys work hard as um but like what you're doing tonight can can ruin you for the rest yes, of the week. So if, you, if you're reaching and pushing and going like that, you just have to kind of allow this sound and that allows that relaxation. I think that's where you were talking about that speech quality element before, that if you just allow yourself to say what needs to be said rather than trying to, you know, yell it out or whatever else, you're going to have a lot more easier, a lot easier time. Um, yeah. One of the biggest things when I do my vocal critiques, as my viewers know, is that I'm always pointing out like there's too much tension here. Like he's pushing way mm. too hard to create this sound. Like you don't have to push to make this sound. You, you don't have mm. to do this strange thing where you're like tighten all your muscles up and to, to make this mm. happen. Yeah, yeah. You don't have to do that. Like you just got to relax. You know, the sound will come. It, you can make the sound whether your face is tense or not. So you don't have yeah, to I, do all that. I stuff. used to have a, a little thing. I used to have a little thing I'd say to my, my singing students when like something well within their range and they're still straining. And I was, it was just like, man, the, the note's there, dude. Why are you reaching for it? Exactly. So you yeah. don't, you don't need a ladder for this. You're right there. It's right here, you know? Yep. Um, but yeah, no, that's the thing. Just open up and let it go. Yeah. I have, I am really on board with the way that you say that you approach things. Cause it's, it's, very it seems very practical and very rational and very measured and that's that's what i advocate in and of itself is just i just mm. came from a you know the official school or whatever <laughs> I mean, yeah, you know I, I get that that's pretentious i understand that and so i i, yeah. I don't want to come across that way but what you're the things that you're saying are very much in line with the kind of things i've learned anyway so like i'm totally on board with it um i just as just as a get i want to give the people some examples of your music in case they've never listened to you before because mm -hmm. they should definitely should check out caligula's horse hint hint um please do yeah um what would you say are your most like if you had to pick like three of the most difficult passages from all of your repertoire from your entire catalog what would they be uh i can really only think of one that is like melodically super tricky uh everything else is is just your general kind of sometimes there's a register change back and forth through the mm -hmm. whole phrase which may end up making you feel a little bit uh kind of tight uh at the end of it i think the end of dream the dead from our most recent mm -hmm. album in contact kind of has that at the end between sort of we will remember oh, yeah, the color, yep. the color, and then it's sort of jumping back and forth between that falsetto register and kind of my mixed register as well and that's kind of a tricky one to do over and over live and uh, as it repeats towards the end of the song but uh the trickiest package pa package the trickiest <laughs> passage uh in all of seahorse's stuff is probably in a gift to afterthought which is the opening track to our second album the tide the thief and rivers End. that's my favorite um 
Oh yeah, that's cool. my favorite album. Yeah, Into the White was my favorite song year anniversary. for a long time. Really? Wait, today? Hey, what, what? Yeah. No, not today. In in October, but it's oh. ten past seven, so I can tell you that uh, we're also uh, reissuing our first two albums on vinyl as well. So that's uh, Rivers End now available on vinyl. You can grab that if you want. That's awesome. Ching. Um, Very cool. That's cool. So uh, a gift to Afterthought, there was a, a bridge section that was originally going to be instrumental when Sam and I were putting it together. And there's this little line that was originally on a glockenspiel, and I think that's still in the mix, sitting behind the vocals. And I really like the melody, and I went, I want to try and write lyrics to this, and that was a real challenge trying to fit it over the um, <laughs> over you know the strange shapes. And it's um, let's see if I can actually do it because I haven't done it in a long time. Um, as stone turns to dust around us, this gift to afterthought brings her own weaknesses. Opening the prison door comes as no consolation to us. Oh, I know what you're talking about. The end. Yeah. yeah. And it's it's really when you take that melody out of context because I've you know obviously it came out because I've been performed it heaps and heaps of times but when you take that melody out of the music and just go like ah that's tricky as uh, and that's about as as tricky as it gets because for the most part I I write or I tend to write um, sort of singable stuff okay. stuff that is really easy you you, peep, you guys heard this a singer writes his own vocal lines you I, that's one thing I've harped on in my videos like if you write a, if you sing a vocal line written by someone who does not sing. You are probably gonna have a hard time with it because people, <laughs> like I, 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 like Bach was a like you know I want to take a classical example. Bach was not a singer, and his pieces are notoriously dif difficult to sing because he treated the voice and his compositions like any other instrument. So you'll have this melisma mm -hmm. of like, I don't know, forty sixteenth notes, and you're supposed to breathe some like you're supposed to either do it without breathing, and a lot of times you'll have you'll see like these the orchestras or whatever like take little pauses or like give him give the singer a second to breathe because Bach just didn't care you know so you yeah. have to I, I'm a huge advocate of writing your own vocal lines without a doubt yeah I think it's one of those things as well because people who don't sing to write like if you're a singer that you're writing for, for another singer there's, there's a, like an easy communication there but I think what a lot of instrumentalists don't think about when they're writing vocals, because uh, their hook might be strong as, right? There might be a really nice hook, but syllable placement has a huge uh, part in how natural it sounds as well. Like if you say these lyrics and they sound good, but then try to sing them in the phrase and it doesn't trip off the tongue in a really nice way, that's going to make it really difficult for a singer as well. So um, I'll be guest on a, a project uh, later in the year. Um, called Ochopinski, which is a, a concept album put together by a friend of mine. Um, and he uh, he sort of written all the lyrics, and it was my, my job to kind of come in on this track and kind of polish through the whole thing and go, like, all right, well, I, I love all of this, but I need to kind of soften these uh, phrases so they're a little bit more singable, so that they have more of a natural flow off the tongue. Otherwise, it sounds really forced and um, clunky kind of syllables on the wrong uh emphasis kind of thing which is always a, a real uh, when i hear that in finished music i'm like eh, it's it's something that irks me yeah i i know we need to wrap this up i got one more question for you and this is a, i might be totally mm. off base with this but when i listen to your you guys's music compared to other prog bands i it sounds to me like the vocals are a lot less produced than than some of the other bands like and i don't mean that as like they sound worse i mean like it sounds like they that you guys aren't putting as much like you don't use as much pitch correction uh you don't mm -hmm. you don't doctor the voice up with as many effects as some other bands do is that true and is that deliberate uh yeah from from bloom onward uh we use no pitch correction whatsoever so um the first album, again, we we had we did, were not a band at that stage. That was like a one-off project thing that kind of accidentally happened. Um, and I think Rivers End, there was some, I, but honestly, I'm I'm not sure. It might have been from then on as well. But we sort of make a point to not use metal, melodyne or, or not sort of tweak things because we want to have the most real performance from all of us as possible. So the least editing we can possibly do. Because I don't want to be known 
as a singer who sounds like this on the record and then just like blows live by comparison, you know, and, 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 and so there's, there's that element, but the, the most important one is that like, I want my artistic message not to be, um, uh, I suppose mess messed up or like miscommunicated by, uh, using, using technology. I want it to be a real emotive, uh, delivery. And in that way, we also aim for sort of like long phrases as well. We try not to do so many kind of drop-ins and things like that. If I can sing a whole verse or chorus or, you know, even longer passages than that in one take, and it's good enough to be on the record, then awesome, because that's what you're going to hear live. And that's, you know, what we're going to do. So, it's the most real form of the music that we can put together without, you know, just being there in the room, I guess. I have an immense amount of respect for that. And I wish more singers today thought about things the way that you do. When, when you sing in classical settings, like the, the entire, like approach was created originally because well, in the 1700s, there were no microphones, you know, there were no recordings. So you had to develop a technique that you could be consistent with and that was sustainable and that, you know, you didn't have the luxury of having things like correct your mistakes for you. So Mm -hmm. it, it sounds, it sounds to me like the, the approach that you take to your vocals, you want to have that element of consistency and sort of like realness, so to speak about it. And I, that's, that's like music to my ears to hear that. And I, I wish that I wish, and I think I, I recognize that in it to a degree, which is why probably why my ear kind of noticed that it didn't seem overly processed. Like it seemed like it was, it's like, all, it's all my uh, flat intonation. That's, that's what gave it away. Well, um, okay. There, there, there's a, there are a couple of notes <laughs> like, but it doesn't matter. Like it didn't, it didn't matter. I think, I think the few times that I've heard some flat stuff, like it was in like in harmonic, like in a textured, like with harmonies and stuff. And I'm, mm-hmm. I'm like, well, it, it didn't, it's not enough to, you know, distract the, flow of the music i don't think but I, I well i mean like all of my all of my favorite albums have wrong notes in them and i, I don't yeah give a shit. I, yeah um, i would rather i would rather hear some imperfection and it sound human than for it to sound perfect oh, yeah. and not sound like a human but that said i'm not i'm not here to, to you know to poo poo people who want to um to have the perfect melody uh, perfect performance like tune melody for their album because if that's the way that they want their art to be presented to the world and they wanted to make sure that it is a pitch perfect demonstration of exactly what they'd written. Awesome. But it ain't for me. Like give me my long sorrowful sobs under a spotlight, uh, and let me be wrong. <laughs> that's uh, words of wisdom. We should all aspire to be more like that. That's uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's okay. It's pretty cool, man. So I, yeah, I don't want to take too much more of your time, but, uh, this was a fascinating interview. Uh, I, I got a lot of insight from this and even though it's, we kind of come from different backgrounds musically and philosophically with this kind of thing, it's, it's interesting to see how they kind of just naturally converge anyway. And that it's, Mm. it's not that far apart in my mind that as a lot of people might think that it is, I think that part of the, Mm. the differing in philosophy comes from the way that my side of the spectrum, so to speak, is projected onto other people. And so I think that Mm -hmm. that stands to suggest that people in my vein of vocal study need to be a little more forthcoming and a little less absolutist about a lot of these things. Um, Because there is, I think, I know for a fact that there are people who um, say, you know, they don't even think about vocal health. They just think the classical way to sing is the only way to sing. And everything else mm-hmm. is wrong, you know, and they, it's not even about a health thing. It's just a, you know, my style is the best because it's the most athletic or whatever you want to call it. So I, yeah. I think that I think that there needs to be because there's things that you can learn from both sides. Your approach with saying that the artistry is the most important to you out of, beyond anything else is something that I think that a lot of classical musicians could in the vocal realm, especially could stand to learn from because it does become very, very technical after a certain point. Yeah, of course. I mean, like again, I think it comes down to style dictating what you do, and classical voice needs to be what it is. But at the same time, I need to cry in front of people uh, sometimes. So, uh, but yeah, I think I think only time will tell um, in terms of how those kind of worlds converge. But I, I think what people will realize is that stylistically, the differences you know between this and that, like the Venn diagram, is closer to a circle than people might think. Yeah, I agree. Um, but uh, yeah, no, it's been an interesting chat. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, I uh, to everyone who's watching, I hope you guys enjoyed this. Definitely, definitely check out Cooley Glue's Horse. I, my favorite is The Tide, The Thief, and River's End. But In Contact, their new album's amazing. Bloom is amazing. I, 
I don't know. If you had to tell you the, tell the tell the viewers one album to start with, what would you say? Uh, in contact, if only just because we recently did it and I still like it. I don't hate it. Yet. Oh, okay. Uh, so, <laughs> so, Very no, cool. dig in. In contact. Wherever you want to start, take the journey. Very cool. All right. Thanks so much, Jim. No worries. Take care. Bye-bye.